Hello everybody, my name is Simon Benvo. I am Learning Manager for Springboard. In today's webinar, we're going to start with an overview of Springboard. I will then talk about the calendars and how the 53 week year that is 2020 will affect the reporting for December. I then hand over to Diane Whirl, our Marketing and Insights Director, and she will give us an overview of the national picture of uh, footfall and sales. I'll then talk a little bit about the tier systems that have been introduced and finally touch on the Christmas rules that have been released by the government. Hello everyone, I'm Diane Whirl, Springboard's Marketing and Insights Director. I'm going to present an overview of trends in UK high streets over the period since January 2020. I'll look at footfall of course, but also spending both online and in bricks and mortar stores. For anyone who isn't familiar with Springboard, I thought it would be helpful to give a quick tour of what we do. We deliver data and insights on customers in destinations and also in bricks and mortar stores. Our key metric is footfall, that's the volume of customer activity, and we track footfall across the UK. We have a network of counters tracking footfall continuously 24 hours a day at around 4,500 locations, and we cover around 250 towns and cities. However, our data isn't limited to footfall. We also collect sales data by day in terms of pounds spent from 1,200 individual retail stores across 11 different retailer categories. This map shows our coverage in high streets, and you can see that we track footfall across all regions of the UK. Our coverage includes all of our regional cities, but also a huge range of towns of different sizes and functions, from large town centres to small local high streets. In fact, we've adopted what we call a hub and spoke approach to our coverage, ensuring that every regional city is included, as these are the hubs of economic activity within each region, but then also smaller towns in the region. This means that in any one region, we're tracking footfall in towns that account for around two thirds of all spend. And nationally, this has ensured that the correlation between our coverage and spend nationally is very high. In fact, around 93%. So our data accurately represents the retail landscape across the UK. The relevance of our footfall data to bricks and mortar performance is demonstrated by the interest that the media shows. We're proud to be their go-to source of comment on bricks and mortar retail performance. And our data and insights are regularly reported on by all of the leading press and broadcast titles. The relevance of our footfall data is demonstrated by the fact that we're a partner of the High Street Task Force, delivering footfall data so the task force can understand high street performance. And we also provide data to both BASE, the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, and the ONS, the Office of National Statistics. And in fact, our data features in the ONS's weekly Faster Indicators report that tracks the impact of COVID-19 on economic activity. Thank you, Diane, for the overview. Next, we're going to briefly talk calendars. Last time, I talked about the structure of the reporting calendar we use and how we make comparisons. So let's talk December 2020. 2020 is an odd year in so many ways, not least of which is that it contains 53 weeks. No wonder it's felt like such a long year. As I talked about before, this additional week is there to offset the time slippage caused by a standard calendar year being a day longer than 52 weeks. And so the 53rd week gets inserted once every six or seven years. Over the next few slides, we'll see how that affects the data and comparisons for December. In the 53 week years, January gains a week, and we talked about how this was dealt with last time. All the other months retain their standard number of weeks. The only real issue occurs when we get to December. The previous year wouldn't contain 53 weeks to allow the direct comparison. So how do we calculate a year on year comparison for December? Firstly, we need to find another week to make December 2019 a full five weeks. We do this by using week one of 2020 and adding this to the end of 2019, as we can see highlighted here in yellow. This now gives us a five week December for comparison, and we use weeks 49 to 53 of 2020 and compare the total to weeks 49 to 52 of 2019 plus week one 2020. As you can see from the week commencing dates, the five weeks in both years are very close, and this is why we add in the 53rd week. I'll touch on January here and go into more detail in the webinar next month. As you'd expect, 2020 will affect the comparisons for 2021 as well, though mostly only in January. While January consisted of five weeks for 2020, in 2021 it will consist of only four. 
And to compensate for this and to align the rest of the year, week one from 2020 will be dropped. As far as comparisons go, we've already made use of week one 2020 in December, so it makes sense that we don't reuse it. And by removing it, all the following months line up nicely, albeit a week later in 2020. And just as a reminder, these are the comparison calculations that we use, and it's because the current periods and previous periods in these calculations must be the same length that we have to have this little workaround for the week, the 53 week years. I'll now pass you over to Dai, who's going to talk us through the trends we've seen in 2020. Here we can see the trend in footfall from the beginning of 2020 in terms of the decline since 2019. I've previously commented on the fact that the graph shows really clearly the absolutely enormous impact that COVID's had on consumer activity, with footfall plunging by more than 80% from last year during the first lockdown. By June, however, the drop had reduced to 50%, helped by the reopening of hospitality, the greater prevalence of staycations and the eat out to help out scheme. It peaked around August bank holiday at 25% down on 2019. Since then, greater restrictions, the rule of six, three local tiers and lockdowns in each nation have had an impact. The most significant drop, by virtue of the far greater footfall generated in England compared to with the devolved nations, occurred during November during the lockdown in England. During that month, footfall in high streets dropped by two thirds from 2019. Since then, there's been a degree of bounce back, but by week 50, the week beginning 6th of December, High street footfall was still 38% lower than in 2019. This graph shows the growth of online spending this year. At the beginning of the year, it accounted for 20.1% of total retail spending. But during the first lockdown, it peaked in May at 32.8%. It dropped back once retail stores reopened, sitting at 26.1% in September. In October, it rose slightly to 28.1%. And I'm expecting the rise to continue into November due to the lockdowns and the proximity of Christmas, probably to more than 33%. I mentioned previously that the level of growth is more than that forecast for 2028, so COVID's clearly accelerated the shift online. What we also need to understand, however, is that there's a clear difference between the significance of online spending on food from non-food. Online food spending peaked at just 11% in May, and drop back marginally to 10% by October. In contrast, online spending on non-food peaked to 43.4% in April, with the peak in online spending on clothing even higher at 47%. By October, it stood at 29.2%, meaning around one pound in every three pounds is now spent online. The impact of COVID on high street footfall has been huge overall, but the degree of impact across different types of high street has varied. This graph shows the trend in four types of town, coastal and historic towns, market towns and regional cities. As I pointed out previously, it shows that smaller towns have been and continue to be more resilient than large city centres. Regional cities across the UK have been massively hit by home working, and the loss of footfall clearly demonstrates the influence of the working population. But they've also been hit by the advice from government to avoid public transport, which of course larger cities are more reliant on than smaller towns. The difficulties in going abroad and consequently the increase in staycations supported coastal and historic towns over the summer. And these two town types and market towns have continued to benefit from consumers staying local. This graph sets out the change in bricks and mortar sales from last year up to the start of lockdown two. It shows the change in sales from last year for each of the 11 retail categories and shows what we all know, that spending in bricks and mortar stores has been severely impacted. Since reopening in June, overall store sales are down 27.1% on last year, but the decline in sales varies by category. The greatest drop by far is in services, which comprises travel agents, estate agents, shoe repairers, etc., followed by food and beverage. We all know the impact on hospitality and entertainment and books, which of course are ideal online purchases. Perhaps the most used barometer of high street performance is fashion and store sales in this category are over a quarter lower than they were in 2019. Taking all current factors and the new restrictions into account, I've put together what can only be an indicative forecast of where footfall in high streets might end up by the end of 2020. 
The solid line in this graph is actual footfall and the dashed line is my forecast, which shows that by the last week of the year, footfall in high streets will still be around a quarter lower than it was in 2019. Thank you, Diane, for those insights. As we know, there have been various measures put in place across the UK. Scotland has a four tier system. England also now has four tiers, while both Wales and Northern Ireland have their own nationwide rules in place. But the question, particularly for those in England and Scotland, is has there been any noticeable impact of the tiers on your place in comparison to others? For Wales and Northern Ireland, has the impact of national restrictions remained consistent? If you're now under the new tier four restrictions in England, how do these compare to the full on lockdown? The data you collect, whether it's footfall, sales, public transport usage, Wi-Fi tracking, etc., can all help to answer this question and allow you to be proactive in the reporting of what's happening in your place. For example, when tiers change, it'd be very interesting to see how this impacts place attendance and usage. Do we see a reduction in footfall as tiers rise and an increase in footfall when tiers drop? Is there actually any change at all in the footfall in your place when tiers change? Or is the impact of the tiers, with the exception of tier four, actually negligible? Does the way people move around the place change now that there are restrictions in place? And is this change an interesting story in itself? Tier four and the additional restrictions on retail and hospitality will clearly have a huge impact in the final days before Christmas. What can your data tell you about behavior under these rules? Do you actually still see a similar number of people due to work, for example, in your place? And are people actually acting on their rebellious statements on social media and ignoring the tier four restrictions? When we get to Christmas, all four UK nations have agreed on a Christmas bubble system for the 25th of December only, and this period is likely to draw some attention from the media. Now the Christmas rule relaxation has been curtailed to just Christmas Day, the likely impact of the easing will not be felt on the high street. After all, retail would have been closed on Christmas Day anyway. What may be interesting is how things behave post-Christmas for areas where retail and hospitality can still function. Understanding how the general public acts through the data you collect can help you to negate any negative views expressed in the media. As many place leaders I've spoken to will attest, for some reason, local media in particular seem to like banging the drum on how poor our high streets are. As an example, photographs taken at an inopportune moment or a carefully calculated angle can make any place look incredibly and irresponsibly busy. I've certainly seen examples on social media of place bashing based on these images and the difficulty place managers can have in undoing the damage caused in a credible way. Unfortunately, the publishing of these images can be incredibly damaging of the public's perception of how safe our places are following all the work completed on safety and social distancing by place managers. I uh, would suggest that if you have access to any high mounted CCTV images, these could be used as a good way to counter any misleading images. Additionally, or alternatively, using the data at your disposal to counter reports like these with actual data can go some way to alleviating the claims. For extra impact, you could use the data to share the facts as a story to make it more engaging and maybe even use it as an opportunity to share when the quiet times in your place are and encourage people to visit during those times instead. In our photograph example, you could use the footfall data you collect to identify the busiest period of the day, match this up to the high level images and so be able to publish how the place looks from a crowding perspective at the busiest times of the week. This combining of data and imagery lends more credibility to your counter arguments. My last point is to proactively share the information you have with the wider public. If you're following the science, then share the science. It's how you bring people along on the ride with you by keeping them informed and showing them how the data is leading your decision making process. And that's all for this month's webinar. Thank you for your time and your attention. And thank you to Diane for sharing her 2020 insights with us. Until next time. Thank you.